Hey, it's Rob Fitzgerald. Welcome back to Lab Medicine. Once again, another quick hit. We're going to talk about uh, thyroid tests today. We're going to talk about thyroid function tests, a fairly commonly ordered test. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the more, maybe a little bit more abstract or, or less often used thyroid tests. Um, so just as a quick reminder and just to put it into context, uh, this is under hypothalamic pituitary control, so the hypothalamus releases uh, thyroid releasing hormone, acts on the anterior pituitary, which releases thyroid stimulating hormone, and which ends up uh, interacting with receptors on the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is in your neck, that's where it's located, and our little diagram here also shows the parathyroid gland. Uh, the parathyroid gland being responsible for calcium homeostasis, whereas the thyroid gland, we think about in terms of uh, thyroxin, T4, and, and T3. Um, really responsible for basal metabolic rate, so increased thyroid hormone increases your basal metabolic rate is, is a, a general way to look at that. So TRH from the hypothalamus acts on the anterior pituitary, which causes it to release thyroid stimulating hormone. It's a, a dimer, it's a glycoprotein. Um, it acts on receptors in the thyroid gland, primarily releasing T4, um, a little bit of T3 as well. T4 gets deiodinated, so you lose a, an iodine functionality, forming T3, T3 being the most active form of the thyroid hormone, which serves as a negative feedback loop and shuts down TSH and uh, thyroid releasing hormone. And so that's how it's supposed to work, and uh, you know, a nice feedback loop to keep things in balance. Um, we talk about primary disorders, and that's at the thyroid gland. And most of thyroid disease is a primary origin. There can also be pituitary problems, and that would be at TSH. And there also can be hypothalamic problems. And, and so we do have a stimulation test that helps us figure out um, primary from secondary. So. General approaches, things to think about. Uh, there's been recently a lot of interest in, in biotin. And so why is biotin an important interference? It's important because many of the lab-based assays use biotin streptavidin as a fundamental principle for doing the test. And people that supplement with biotin, especially when they're taking super physiologic, uh, you know, a thousand times what the RDA is. So um, a normal multivite won't affect this, but if they're taking, uh, you know, milligram doses, the RDAs in micrograms, um, then you can get these interferences. And so the, the, the recommendation is, is two days of, of being biotin free. Um, so if someone's taking biotin as a supplement for their hair or their nails or something like that, um, the recommendation is two days of biotin free. To, and what's interesting about this interference is, is that it's sort of a perfect storm in that it causes falsely low TSH and it causes falsely elevated free T4. And, and we'll see why that's such a bad thing. And, and really that's two independent lab tests um, are saying hyperthyroidism when in fact both of those are artifacts of the biotin. So um, can be a problem, generally not, but uh, something to be aware of. Uh, the other thing to think about is it's thyroid test, a lot of diseases change thyroid. It's, you know, it's, it's related to your basal metabolic rate, and if you're sick from some other thing, your thyroid is actually reacting to that, and, and you change both your TSH and your free T4. Um, so generally you want to measure it as an outpatient on, on well, you know, you know, no other uh, uh, diseases that are you know, apparent. Um, our best test is, uh, is TSH, so that's sort of the take-home message is we screen with TSH. It is a biologic feedback of active thyroid hormone, and so we use TSH as our screening test, and then we follow that up with um, a, uh, a free T4 or a free T3. Most clinicians today use a free T4 because that's what they're used to, and, and it's a reasonable approach. It seems to work. So our general approach is uh, a TSH followed by a free T4, and, and we'll talk about what does a free T4 actually mean. So T3 and T4, T4 is thyroxin. It has four iodines on a, a tyrosine metabolite that's been created in, in the thyroid gland. Um, and as we said, it, it is primarily it gets, it gets deiodinated to the active form of, of T3.
Um, uh, T3 is the active form. Um, both of these are under control of TSH, so with TSH, your thyroid gland uh, is activated and you start to actively synthesize both T3 and T4 on thyroglobulin, and, and we'll talk about what that is. So people sometimes get confused about thyroglobulin and thyroid binding globulin. And so when we're talking about binding globulins, we're talking about TBG, or thyroid binding globulin. It also binds uh, albumin and alpha-1 uh, protein as well. But what the th what's important to think about is, is that T4 and T3 are highly bound to proteins, and the protein-bound forms are, are pretty much inactive. And so we are really, and, and there's a lot of things that change the binding globulins. So your total concentrations of T4, and generally when we say T4, we're talking about total T4. When we say free T4, that's the free molecule, or, or, or small f T4 is, is free T4. Um, so that's sort of just the conventions. So free T4 and free T3 are the active forms, and with free T3 being primarily the active one. Um, they are better indicators. So measuring a free sort of gives you what the active component of your thyroid hormone is, and that's really why we prefer to measure free hormones as opposed to the total hormones. Um, so oftentimes the free hormones are a reflex based on what ha what's happening with your TSH. So, you know, if your TSH is normal, most people don't get any further follow-up. If their TSH is abnormal, then they're going to get a free T4 or a free T3. So as we said, they're highly bound to, to plasma proteins. T3 is, is thyroid binding globulin is a very high affinity protein, and that's primarily where your T3 is bound. T4, as we said, it binds to some other um, glycoproteins, prealbumin, albumin, and alpha-1. Um, so 99% and uh, you know, more than 99% of both of these molecules are highly bound and or in the inactive states. Um, so things that affect binding globulins, um, you know, things that increase the binding globulins um, would be estrogens, pregnancy, oral contraceptives. Um, those are very commonly encountered, and, and in that case, your your total T4 is going to be high, but your TSH is going to be normal and typically your free T4 is also going to be normal. So we just circumvent that by just measuring a TSH and a free T4. Um, they can also have decreases in binding globulins and in the same thing, your, your total T4 would be low in that case, but your free T4 and your TSH should be normal. So again, our, our primary screening test is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It's a glycoprotein, so it's a a, uh, a polypeptide. Um, it has two subunits, an alpha and a beta subunit. And, and why is that important? That's important because the alpha subunit is also shared by FSH, LH, and HCG. And what's the, the, the beta subunit gives you the primary biological function of the molecule. It also is what we target when we're trying to measure it because it distinguishes you know, one from the others. But what's interesting is, is that if you have really high concentrations, such as in trophoblastic disease, where your HCG can go up into the million range, some of these patients also get thyrotoxic just because there is a little bit of cross-reactivity of that alpha subunit, and you do get some stimulation of the gland. Um, so the beta subunit is, is the primarily biological active uh, component of it. Um, again, we use it uh, as our, our screening test. It also, um, so it can be used to look at pituitary function as well. So if you have uh, primary hypothyroidism, you don't have enough T4 converting to T3 to feed back in a negative manner. And so you're going to get an elevation of TSH in primary hypothyroidism. If you have secondary hypothyroidism, you're going to have both a low free T4 and a low TSH. Um, and so that, in that case, you might want to step back one level and do a TRH stem test, which we'll talk about in a second. So 
it's elevated in primary hypothyroidism and it's decreased in secondary hypothyroidism. That makes sense because secondary, the problem is at the pituitary. Total thyroid hormones, um, as we said, they're influenced by binding globulins. And so um, T4, total T4, um, and a total T3, both of these are less frequently monitored. And I think one of the take-home messages is, is that um, none of the thyroid tests are perfect. Um, they're immunoassay-based, and especially the free thyroid hormone measurements, um, there are issues with that, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. They're really sort of really good estimates of a free T4. Um, so that's what T4 looks like. It's, it's, uh, this is actually uh, starts out as tyrosine. That's the, uh, the amino acid that it starts out with. Tyrosine binds to thyroglobulin in the thyroid gland, and it gets uh, iodinated. And it either can be iodinated in, in both the three and the five position or just in the three position. And so if it's iodinated in both positions, um, there's a linker that links two different tyrosine molecules. And if they're fully iodinated, you form T4. And if you had monoiodinated, tyrosine and diiodotyrosine um, being linked together, you get T3. And as we said, T4 gets converted into three th T3 in the periphery, primarily in the liver, uh, to form the active component. So free thyroid hormones, my take-home message is, is that they, they are the best reflex test after a TSH. Some people would say maybe run a TSH and a free T4. Generally, uh, we're running TSHs and uh, ordering a, a, a free thyroid hormone if the TSH is abnormal. Um, so as I said, there was a couple different ways to measure it. Most laboratories in the high volume setting are doing it by immunoassay. Immunoassays are quick, um, they're reasonably accurate, they're, they're clinically useful, but they're not perfect. Um, the other way to do it, and, and, and people would say that dialysis or ultrafiltration um, basically, by dialyzing against a membrane where only the free gets through, you can get a more accurate measurement of what's actually as the free hormone. Um, in most cases, the immunoassays and, and the dialysis have, have good approximations, um, but there are cases where you have, you know, differences in binding globulins or differences in albumin that might cause uh, uh, the immunoassay to be inaccurate. So. Um, sometimes our endocrinologists order a, a free thyroid hormone by equilibrium dialysis and mass spectrometry, which would probably be, you know, the reference method for doing that. Um, so it's used in, in some difficult cases. <clears throat> Other tests that we use, so, so a TSH and a free T4, we talk about those as thyroid function tests. You know, if someone's talking about a TFT, that is a, a free T4 follow, you know, a TSH followed by a free T4. Um, other things that we measure, antithyroid antibodies. Um, we measure these as uh, indicators of autoimmune disease. And so um, w there's several different ones. We measure antithyroglobulin antibodies and antimicrosomal antibodies. Um, so Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune disease that causes destruction of the adrenal uh, gland. Um, and so these are antibodies that are binding to of various epitopes and destroying tissue. Um, <clears throat> TRABs uh, are another type of antibodies, and, and these are interesting um, because they can be stimulating, um, neutralizing, or blocking. And so um, essentially what these are, these are immunoglobulins that bind to the TSH receptor on the thyroid gland. So, um, in the case of stimulating antibodies, we call this thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. This is typically an IgG that binds to the TSH receptors. It's, I don't really understand why it does that, but it does. And when it binds, it's activating just like TSH, uh, upregulating the function of the thyroid gland, and you're producing too much T4, so they become hyperthyroid. And so TSI we, is, is found in Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroidism. So the TSI mimics the TSH, but it's not subject to the negative feedback. So you get continued stimulus of the thyroid gland and hyperthyroidism. Um, 
blocking antibodies. Uh, so if they're blocking the TSH receptor, these patients can become hypothyroid. So it's important to understand if it's a neutral blocking or stimulating antibody. Briefly measure reverse T3. Um, doesn't get measured in most clinical practices. Um, it is, so we, we show the, the diagram of, of, uh, of T3 and, and T4. It's essentially where the other iodine is missing from, from the ring that's, that's sort of uh, opposite of the one in, in regular T3. So we call it reverse T3. It's an inactive um, hormone. Um, and uh, consequently, it, it doesn't have a whole lot of clinical use, but occasionally it gets measured, and it, it, it increases in what we call sick euthyroid syndrome or sick euthyroid in illness. And euthyroid means normal thyroid function, but in the case of sick euthyroid, you could have abnormal thyroid function tests, but it's really in response to an illness, and, and your thyroid is, is functioning appropriately. Um, so in that case, instead of forming the active T3, you form the inactive reverse T3, so you don't ramp up your basal metabolic rate when you're sick. Um, yeah, so sick euthyroid means normal thyroid function, but you can have abnormal uh, thyroid labs. Thyroglobulin. So we talked about TBG, that's the binding globulin. We don't measure TBG clinically, we just sort of infer that by based on a, a free T4. If your total T4 is high and your free T4 is normal, you know you have an increase of TBG and, and really you don't care, you're really concerned about what is your free T4. In the case of thyroglobulin, what we're doing here, thyroglobulin is a cancer marker. And so thyroglobulin, it's, it's normal function is that's where tyrosine binds, that's where you get iodination of the tyrosine, and that's where you get linkage of two different iodinated tyrosine molecules to form either T3 or T4. So it has a, it has a normal function, um, but if you have a thyroid cancer and you've had a thyroidectomy, you don't really have a source of thyroglobulin, and so your thyroglobulin should be undetectable. And really, cancer markers are used to detect recurrence. So in this case, someone's had a thyroidectomy. They've given time for their existing thyroglobulin to be metabolized. And, you know, and they're going to monitor them a month later, six months later, a year later, and see if they have any thyroglobulin coming back. And so if thyroglobulin comes back, that suggests that the tumor um, is either metastasized or they didn't get all the tissue. And so that's an indication for either radio ablation or, or whatever else the clinician thinks is appropriate. Um, so thyroidectomized patients should have no circulating thyroglobulin. Um, and if you see a, a post-surgical or a post-intervention um, increase, then that's indicative of, of tumor recurrence. So the last test we'll talk about is a TRH-TSH stem test. And so in this case, you're giving TRH, that's the hypothalamic input, and you're measuring the pituitary response. And so you help, you're really trying to figure out do you have a, a, a primary or secondary hypothyroidism. So if you give TRH, you're expecting to see a, a bump of the, in the TSH. Um, so if you have no increase, that would be consistent with pri, uh, pituitary hypothyroidism. Um, if you have tertiary hypothyroidism, um, your, your hypothalamus pituitary axis, your pituitary um, is hypofunctional, um, and so by giving TRH, you can restore the function of the pituitary. So here we go. Um, really no reason to do it in primary hypothyroidism where you already have a TSH that's high. Um, you would do it in the setting where you had a low TSH and uh, you're trying to figure out if you had a hypothalamic or a, a pituitary response. So a normal response, you give TRH, we're measuring TSH, um, you give TRH and you get an increase of TSH. That makes sense. And then it starts to go back down by about 60 minutes. If you have a hypothalamic hypothyroidism, your pituitary is hypo, hypofunctional. You gave TRH, 
and you get sort of a delayed response and an increase of TSH. If you have a pituitary deficiency, you have a TSH that's flatlined, you give TRH, and your, your pituitary is not responding to the input, so it stays flat. So thanks for tuning in for laboratory diagnosis of thyroid disease, and uh, hope to see you again.